Facebook marketing did not do as well as I'd hoped it would. It was very expensive for a startup to be using Facebook marketing. So I sort of went to, I guess you could say guerrilla style marketing of having my subscribers more or less market the game themselves. Welcome to Yaro's podcast, where you'll discover the stories behind world-class performers, business builders, and enlightened leaders. Do you suffer from email addiction? Yeah, I have, and I'm a recovering email addict. Thankfully, I took a step that broke me free from the email trap. Most business owners spend a lot of time during their working day inside their inbox, and it may be even bleeding into your home life where you spend hours at night or first thing in the morning attempting to clear that email inbox. Now, it's not surprising because email is where often the most important messages come. We get messages from our clients, our potential customers, from our contractors, our employees, possibly friends and family, everything going on with our lives and our businesses. So the idea of outsourcing or handing over that email inbox to someone else is not something you may have considered before. But I want to tell you, it is by far the most powerful productivity step you can take is to hire someone to handle your email for you. It frees you up so you have more time to do whatever you'd like, whether it's growth activities in your business, creating products, working on marketing campaigns and relationships with other people, or maybe just spending more time with your friends and your family or working on your own health, exercising, taking holidays and so forth. When you're glued to your email inbox, it keeps you away from all those activities. Now, the strange thing is we're usually very comfortable outsourcing all kinds of other aspects of our business. But for some reason, email is one of the last things or perhaps something you never have considered outsourcing to someone else. Well, I have some exciting news. I actually have a company called InboxDone.com. You may have heard of it. We provide a human being to take over your email. I've actually had someone handle my own email inboxes for over 12 years now. So I took the step to break free many, many years ago, and I haven't gone back. I now could never go back to doing my own email. It would be very difficult. And I'd like you to experience the same sense of freedom. So if you're curious on how exactly someone could take over your email and, and how the process works and how you can come to trust someone to handle that all important inbox, I recommend you head over to inboxdone.com and check out my company. There's a real opportunity here for you to potentially change your life and certainly change your business for the better. Create some freedom, some time by handing over that inbox to someone who should really spend more time there than you do because that's their job and it's not your job. Inboxdone.com. Check it out. Hi, this is Yarrow and thanks for joining me on the podcast today. I have a guest that I'm unusually excited about because his business is very unique, something I've never really come across before, a combination of different elements and you know, very cutting edge in some ways and very old in other ways. And he came to my attention through also a first time experience. My guest today actually is a current customer of my Inbox Done company, which you might know myself and Claire as a co-founder, we started that helping people with their email. And my guest uh, approached us to become a client. And during that process of learning about him and his business, I was like, I've got to get this guy on the podcast because his story is so unique. So you're in for a treat today. I'd, I'd like to welcome Chris Barnes to the show. Hello, Chris. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'd like to, and I was deliberately vague about what your business is, because I think you would do a, a better job of explaining uh, the combination of elements that go into this business. So what exactly are you uh, in charge of at the moment, Chris? I am the owner and the founder of Escape the Crate Subscription Box Adventure, which is a play-at-home escape room. That's a subscription box that you can play with your friends and family at home, and it brings all the fun of an escape room right to your dining room table. So for those who want to follow along, because I know Chris is going to talk about his business quite a lot, if you go to www.escape-the-crate.com, or just Google Escape the Crate, that's what I did to find it. It should pop up, yeah. Yeah, I it, it was in the top there. So Okay, uh, good. Yeah, <laughs> good work. <laughs> I always like to hear that. <laughs> and you can check out some of his games. That what I love about them is they're very historical, a lot of history involved. There's the Colosseum, there's dinosaurs, there's the Trials of Houdini, lots of cool games. And what makes this story 
extra special is Chris actually made all of these games himself. So I just want to clarify because I think this really we need to highlight this. So this is a subscription online business where people come to Chris's website, they sign up for the subscription, he sends them a box, a crate with a game inside it that they unpack with their friends and family. It's like an escape room where they have to solve puzzles to escape. They learn about history, get some education, and then uh, they get these delivered. I think it's every two months, right, Chris? They get That's uh, correct, yes, every other month. So you skip a month in there. And Don't you overload get, you have too many escape room boxes. Right. And you made all these games yourself in terms of the physical pieces, the ideas in the game itself. It's 100% the Chris Barnes show, right? It sure is. I have the dark circles under my eyes to prove it. But yeah, it is. And so I design the games. I get all of the different, I manufacture all the different products that go inside of it, design the outer cartons, create the websites, and then get it out to the customers by shipping it out. So it's entirely my business, uh, which is, has its own you know, rewards and is also frustrating at times, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. And it's not just a startup, really. It's, it's as you told me off air, you've just passed a million dollars in sales of your games. We sure did. And that's like, uh, so. as a one-man show, in some ways, you're a seven-figure individual entrepreneur. So I, I feel like I have to warn you, you might start getting asked for more interviews after this first <laughs> podcast. So you might be starting oh, something okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to go back in time, Chris, and talk about sure. how this all started, because obviously there's a, a unique combination of you know internet business skills here, gaming skills, historical skills. I'd love to know, were you ever an entrepreneur in your past as a, as a kid, as a teenager, or were you just a gamer or a history nerd? What, what's your past like? Well, all of the above, especially the history nerd. That definitely is true. Okay. Uh, no, when I was a kid, I loved playing games. I was always that kid that would call up all of his friends and say, hey, come to my house. And they'd expect to play basketball or football or something. But instead, I'd bring them down to the basement where there was a big pile of games to play, you know, most of which are still in shrink wrap that I'll get to someday and things like that. But I've always loved playing games and I always loved teaching history. And so when I was a kid, I thought I would want to be a, an author. I thought I wanted to create these big dramatic stories. And I wrote an actual full novel, which I read back now and I'm thinking, what was I thinking? But I was very proud of it then. But then it was about middle school, late middle school. I realized that I didn't know if I wanted to be an actual writer or an author of writing books. So when I was thinking about what sort of job to get into or what to go into, I chose to keep the creative part and keep the writing part, but not with myself. I chose to become a teacher. So I chose to teach writing and reading to middle school students. And so I thought that way I could still have the best of all possible worlds. I could help encourage other people to show their creativity. And so I spent seven years as a fifth grade teacher in a public school uh, district. And I taught reading and writing. So I got to keep on with encouraging people of creativity and using it. And then also I was a social studies and history teacher as well. And I sort of discovered my love of history even more through teaching it. And so I thought, you know, well, I'll just be a teacher and it'd be, a, it'd be fantastic. But the more I taught, the more I began to kind of wish I got to be a little bit more creative. Mm. I loved teaching, but there were those times when I pulled out the book and went, everybody turned to page 375. And I was thinking, gee, I wish I was teaching this book instead. Mm. And so I began to kind of think, what if I want to do a little bit more with that? And that kind of led to the entrepreneurial, you know, spirit eventually. Which, and I guess we should clarify, there's one element we're missing here is the escape room part of uh, your business, which is, I guess, the most current aspect because it's kind of like a, a fairly new trend, right? So, Right, exactly. So how did it's, you get into been, escape rooms? Well, escape rooms have been growing more and more over the last few years. When I first discovered them, it was about five years ago. There was an escape room that opened up in the city near where I lived, and I liked the idea of being able to play like a video game in a room with all the props around you and like trying to solve a murder mystery. So I thought, this sounds really cool. So I dragged one of my friends with me. And I don't even know if the place is still open now, but it was a very plain room. It had like a desk in the corner locked with like a billion padlocks on it and two shabby pictures on the wall. But we uh, played the escape room. We didn't make it out the first escape room, which I am, I, it, it, it kills me inside to say that I, <laughs> I lost my first escape room. So, but we got done with it. And I remember stepping outside and I looked at my bud and I was like, I've got to do another one of these right now. So that night we booked another escape room at the same place and went back to it again. 
And since then, I've just become completely hooked to escape rooms. I've played over 120 escape rooms in the country. Whenever I go to a new city, I try to play at least one, if not two or three escape rooms while I'm there. So I began to you know, play these all the time. And the more I played them, the more I just kept getting my creative juices going where I'm thinking, oh, I would love to make my own one of these. And I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but I chose to actually create one in my classroom. Okay, before we dive into that story, I just want to check one thing. Sure. No entrepreneurial experience with any other business before this, or was there something else you used to run? There were no other businesses before this. However, I did, through my school and through a couple other schools, I did run after school, uh, or I should say summer school events, where I did do it to make money. But instead of having like a game that someone bought, it was more of an experience that people signed up for that I made the profits from myself. So for example, I did a a week where students could come to a magic school. And so they learned about uh, Greek mythology and they learned about magical, mystical creatures and they learned how to do spells and do, you know, magical games kind of along the Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Harry Potter sort of a style. And so I did that and I actually made up a few escape rooms as well under that summer school program. But that was it. I didn't have any products that were launched. It was just people paying to come do an experience I was running. So while you were running those summer programs, was there anything in your mind about there's a product here I could sell or are you just sort of ha- kind of happy making a little extra cash in summer or were you thinking maybe I can roll this whole summer experience out across all of America? Like what were you thinking at the time? At, at that stage, it was just focused on the summer because this always happened right after the school year. And as any teacher can tell you, as soon as the school year is over, you feel like just falling on the couch and sleeping for the entire summer. Mm. And so I would do this and it was a lot of fun, but I didn't see at that stage how it could be mass produced and brought out to people. Because when I did an escape room, it was literally taking a gigantic library and filling it up with locked safes. And I had huge props in there of mummies and statues. And I had a greenhouse full of fake snakes people had to reach into and grab stuff out of. And so at that stage, I was thinking of a physical escape room. And I was thinking, there's no way you could ever send this stuff out because it would cost so much money to send all the supplies out and take so much training for someone to get it set up, it could never work. So Mm. at that stage, I hadn't kind of thought of doing anything as a product to sell. Do you know the history of escape rooms, how they got started? So people argue back and forth about where escape rooms came from. Some people say they came from Europe. Some people say they came from Asia. Basically, the idea that started was people wanted to have a real life video game experience. And so the first ones were people were locked in a room with a character and it was almost like they were inside of a living play. Instead of sitting in a seat and watching a play going on, you were suddenly in the room with the secret agent and they're trying to defuse the bomb and you get to help out by looking around the room for things the bad guy left and entering codes in. Mm. And there were a lot of these point and click games that began appearing uh, where on your cell phone or back in the old PC where you'd have, you know, a temple to get into and you have a, you have to put in, get to click certain stones to get you in to create these combinations. So eventually people kind of merge those two ideas together and created the escape room we know today where you go into a room, there's a timer on the wall, you have an hour and you have to solve all the puzzles and riddles to get out of it. And I know certain cities in Europe, they are very common. I have a subscriber who was saying that where he lives, there is an escape room on almost every single corner, which blows my mind. It really does. I want to go visit. I want to go find out where this is. So, I mean, it's about 2015 they came to America. And, Mm. I mean, if you look at the trends, they're appearing in shopping malls and next to Disney World and things like that. They're showing up everywhere now. Must be a profitable business if they're doing so well. I guess you set up a room and then you just have to get new people in all the time, right? Right, exactly. To have an actual physical escape room, you have to have a very high investment to create a good room. You don't want to be that person that goes to Ikea, spends 70 bucks, puts some furniture in the room and then says, you're done. Because most of the escape rooms that are succeeding now, they have budgets of you know, 50, 60, some have, you know, over $100,000 per room budget Mm -hmm. with huge technical innovations inside of it. But once they build the room, you basically have to hire a game master to watch the room and then fix broken props. Besides that, it's pure profit. You can run the same room 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. So people that run escape rooms, if you do it correctly, can make a lot of money. I think it's safe to say that when 
an escape room appeared on Big Bang Theory, that was the day they went mainstream oh. as well. Yes, I, I, I loved that episode. It was great with the zombie in the corner. I'll tell you, in that room, having Sheldon Cooper do a room, that's terrifying. I'm, I don't want Sheldon Cooper to do my room at all because <laughs> – he blows through my puzzles in 10 minutes, I'm going to be very upset. Yeah, so. probably, probably would. Okay, so what I love then, you've taken a physical business, which like you said, could be $100,000 per room to set up. So it's you know pretty big sunk cost to start that kind of business. And you've gone and made it online with far, I'm guessing, less upfront costs. But I'm guessing you, know, you weren't thinking like, oh my God, this is going to be this seven-figure business like you have now, this million-dollar sales business when you first got no. started. So you can maybe tell us how you did the very first version of your, I don't want to call it a digital escape room, but your play-at-home escape room. Well, to create the play-at-home or the digital escape room, I had to first find out what did not work with the regular escape room. And because I was a teacher at that stage, I decided I was going to do an escape room with my class, my fifth graders. And we had been reading a book and right before the test, I thought, let's do a review. I'm going to create an escape room in my classroom. And so since I'd only been to real escape rooms, I uh, set up you know, a safe in the room and stuff hidden all around. I called the principal into the room because I was so proud the kids were going to solve this escape room. It was going to be great. And it was a disaster. Students began to like throw desks around and they were emptying the trash can. And you had a student crying in the corner that they didn't have the black light. And I thought, okay, this is not going to work out. There's something wrong with it. But I didn't want to give up on doing an escape room in my classroom. So I thought, how can I do this without all that chaos? And so I thought, what if I have the students sitting in groups? Because they already had reading groups that they were put in together, small groups they're sitting in. What if I were to take the entire room and shrink it down to one pizza box size escape room that I could put down on the table for each group to solve? And instead of having giant safes to unlock, there would be a website. And when students found the answer to a puzzle, they would type the answer in on the website and it would say, yes, you opened up the safe or nope, wrong, try again. And so I tried this out with my classroom, and it was such a huge difference from that first chaotic mess of an escape room I did to the second one where I could see every student was participating and everyone uh, was helping each other out, and I could listen to their thinking, and I thought, this is pretty cool. So Christmas break came, and I thought, I'm going to make up one of these for my friends and family. And so I made up one for friends and family, and the first thing they said when they played it was, Chris, you've got to sell these. This what, is awesome. What was it? Chris, what was that first one for your friends? It family? was actually the first one that I sold. It's called Escape the Confederate Spy Mistress. And I am obsessed with history. I love history in any way, shape, and form, but I especially love the Civil War. And there's a Civil War spy that I am obsessed with. Like my house has an entire library dedicated to the spy. She ran a spy network in Washington, D.C. And so I thought, a spy, Washington, D.C.? I'll make up one on her. And so I made up this whole escape room based on a historical person and historical events that happened using a real historical code that that person used. Oh, wow. And what, so when I got just, done with it, just her the... name is Rose, Rose O'Neill Greenhow. Okay. And she was a Confederate spy in Washington. Mm -hmm. And she was said to have notes about Lincoln's cabinet that Lincoln didn't even have. Wow. So she was pretty successful for a short period of time. And so I had her code. I was like, let's try this out. And my friends and family liked it. And so the next thing I knew, I was trying to figure out how to start an online business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the next step, right? It's a big step. Can you tell me that first version of the game? Because I've seen sort of your more recent ones based on the website. Again, if people want to check it out, you know, escape-the-crate.com. You have physical pieces of gaming materials that go with each of these escape rooms. And I know you're a one-man show, basically, until we came along and helped you with some of the email customer right. service. But you design the games, you come up with the, the, the actual puzzles to solve, as well as the physical pieces. What about your first version, though? Because was that, I can't imagine as a, a test, because I, I know with some of the coaching I do, I, I teach the students to create a minimal viable product or a minimal viable service, right. like a basic version. And you had this it's great- It's a beta test. Yeah. And you had a, you had a proving ground in your, your school, which is really fun. You could just, you know, your kids were your first test customers Oh, and they are ways. brutally honest. I'll yeah. tell you that. Kids are way more honest than adults are about that. <laughs> exactly. Things. Then you switch to your friends and family and they're adults, so it's a little different. I mean, you could have gone after the children's market, I guess, but you know- you, you, And I do. I actually have a box for the children's market okay. as well. That's fantastic. So, so, but you know, the first version of your game, I don't even think, like, did you go to your local game shop and buy props? Like, what do you do to make a game? 
I wanted to buy props, but I knew right away that if I was going to be selling something to people, to other customers, I couldn't just go to Hobby Lobby, grab a whole bunch of a toy or something and throw them in a box. I had something that could be very consistent because when you're playing a game where people are looking for clues, every box has to be completely identical. And so I began to, for the first boxes, not that way now, but for the first boxes, I handmade everything. Wow. So I had pieces of cloth that were cut in certain situations. At that stage, not now, but that stage, everything was printed off of my desktop printer. So I had pieces of paper in there. Everything was just being copied and printed out. And it did not look very good. I'll admit that. The first version of the game was a bunch of envelopes with stickers on them, pieces of paper with writing and code on it. But at the same stage, you got to do a lot with that. Because if you got a piece of paper, you could find out as a part of a puzzle, if you cut certain places on the piece of paper, a code will be revealed. Or if you hold the, the piece of cloth up to a light, a hidden code will appear magically. And so it took a lot of effort to figure that out. Now, there's no way, even with the people I have helping produce now in a uh, distribution center, there's no way I can do some of those things now. It just isn't viable to do from the first box. Well, you wouldn't have been able to do that for very long. I mean, it's the minute you reach 100 orders, you're ready. Like, <laughs> you're I, a- kept up that, I kept up that level of detail until I got to about 1,000 orders. Oh and then gosh. by that stage, because I was still teaching every day. Okay. So I would, I would work from, I would get to school about 6.30, I get out of school about 4:30. I then would work in the business from 4:30 until about 1:30 in the morning. Wow. And then I would get about 4 or 5 hours sleep and then restart the next day. Wow. And so it was literally just all my friends knew if they wanted to come over, I'd be sitting there stuffing envelopes and working on boxes for a while there. Can you take us from the first game you made for your friends and family to the first sale of a product? Sure. So I realized I had to simplify things already from that stage. But the biggest thing I had to go to selling the product was to take something that had a very simple website and have an elaborate website that would go along with the game. Because first off, from the landing homepage, you can sell the game to people. But then all the game needs to be played off of the website as well, because half the story is told through audio on the website, video on the website, and then that's how you check your codes. Do you make the audio in the video? I do. I make the audio, the video, and I create, yes, with my voice. <laughs> and I have some other people that help out with voice acting sometimes. But it was funny, the one box, I didn't have my voice in it. And I had people going, oh my gosh, were you okay? What happened to <laughs> you to the normal voice? Like, was he fired? And I'm thinking, no, no, he was not fired. He's still here. Hi, it's me. But yet, no, it was, so I had to create a website, finish from the ground up. And so I had very little website experience. So I kind of learned on the job. Because in my opinion, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, I mean, yes, pass off some things when you can't handle them anymore, but you need to learn everything that you're doing. That way you can be there to help out. You don't have to worry about calling other people. I'm very much a hands-on, a little bit of a control freak, I guess you could say. (laughs) I want to make sure that I know how to do everything. So it was getting that website ready to be launched. And of course, learning things. Like I was ready to launch it. Then I realized... I don't have a privacy policy on the website or terms and conditions and all that fun stuff and having to call lawyers and figure out how to get everything set up. But I realized that if I had one game I was selling, that was great and I could make a one-time purchase and that'd be wonderful. But I wanted to create an escape room that continued one week or one box after another, kind of like a TV series. And so I thought, what if I were to take this idea I have of selling this one escape room box I created and I turn it into a subscription, kind of like BarkBox or one of those other loot crate that you get something sent to you in the mail every month. And so I thought, what if I do an escape room where when you finish an escape room, it's a clear ending, you've solved that problem, but you get a clue as to how the story continues in a future box. Mm. And people were to hang on and stay with you on a subscription basis. And they can cancel at any time, but as long as they want to stay with you, the story unfolds and gets bigger and grander, kind of like a TV series. Yeah, that's so cool. And so that's where I chose the subscription model, which it has its advantages and disadvantages. I knew right away that it would be great because you have a customer makes a purchase and if they like it, that customer will automatically make the purchase the next month. This is a subscription and they hang on there with you. So when renewal time comes, I'll have that you know, recurring income coming in. Mm. But it also has the problem, though, with the fact that you better make sure you have enough ideas to make it 
every month, yeah. or in my case, every other month, because if not, you're going to let a whole, people, whole bunch of people down when they're ready for your box and you have writer's block. You can't afford to have writer's block in that situation. Did you make that decision from day one? Like that first time you sold this first game, there was already a subscription in place and you had the pressure to make a second game coming up in two months. Is that right? Yes. Right after I made that decision, I figured before I make it go live and put it on a subscription box marketplace, I'd better have three full games designed. And so I sat down and I literally designed the next two games. So I had three games ready to go um, at that stage. And then a little bit of a head start. That way, you know, because life gets in the way. Sometimes you have vacations and mm. weddings and things like that. You can't always be getting a box ready. You had to be a little bit ahead. But yeah, I, I had that, that idea in mind from the beginning. But I knew that you can have too much of a good thing. And getting a box every month in the mail, suddenly you have 12 boxes a year coming. And I love escape rooms. And I do them way more than most people. But I know I wouldn't have time to play 12 boxes over the course of a year. So I chose to go buy monthly. That way, people get a box every other month from me. And that way, you know, six boxes a year is a little bit easier to manage. You might not be able to get your friends together for a game night every single month, but I'm betting every other month you mm. can. And so that's one of those decisions yeah, that I, I mean, made. You might have people want to buy all 12 at once and just sit down over, you know, a weekend. Oh, just, we've had that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I've had some people, I think that they literally just ate, ate slept, slept, drank everything. This game is straight, which is really cool. I love it. I really do. But you go crazy doing them all in a row after each other. I can imagine. Just a little bit. I love the idea, though, of the continuity between games. I can imagine, like, it's a bit like a Doctor Who episode where, you know. Very much. Yeah, you're time traveling. So you're one minute, you're with the Confederate spy mistress, then you're in the Roman Coliseum. And there's some sort of underlying thread between these mysteries that connects them, but they're obviously in their very separate standalone time periods and, and episodes. Exactly. So. Every box has a beginning, middle, and an end and a problem. So if you get gifted a box and you just have one box to play, you're happy with the entire thing. But if you play it in order, you can actually see the whole storyline develop and you get to know the characters and their weaknesses and their flaws and you know, get to know the villain of the escape room and see how the master plan is. So it's kind of cool. And it also mm. is neat to sneak in some Easter eggs and, and you know future boxes that have stuff that happened previously, throw mm. a prop in that they, they've seen before. It's kind of like a nod. Or, you know, when I did a movie game, uh, making the movie posters about previous boxes, which is kind of cool. Kind of keeps uh, customers on their toes and gives me a little bit of creative freedom there. Yeah, it must be so fun because you've probably got these super fans who are, you know, looking for everything that connects the stories. And you're kind of like a screenwriter with the Easter eggs and, you know, keeping maybe one character showing up in certain places. Just kind of, exactly. you're creating your own canon almost for a, an entire world you've created within this context of escape room games so it's very unique. It's, it's very it's very <laughs> cool when that happens especially when people start asking about a character hey we haven't seen this character show up in a few boxes what's going on and there are sometimes i've that's been on purpose and other times i've thought oh well i guess i forgot to put them in oops sorry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but there is kind of a fan community based on it where it's kind of funny they will scour through the games and they'll look for secret messages I've hidden that aren't part of the game that are larger codes. And I've done that before. I've hidden little things inside of it. But I love how sometimes they find clues that aren't really clues. Like they'll go, oh, there's no period in the third sentence on clue number seven. I bet you that's a clue. And they're like circling it and they're sharing stuff online. And I'm thinking, wow, I wish I had enough time to create massive conspiracy theories like yeah. that. So you need a writer's room so you guys can sit there, 12 of you <laughs> planning yes. out. Yes, <laughs> that would be nice. That would be really nice. <laughs> I've kind of got, gotten lost in the game a bit here, Chris. So can we just go take a step back? We didn't even say, sure. when did you make the first sale? Because you, you said you prepared three and then you were going to list the game. Well, I want to get this right. You have a website that you created yourself that was very much part of the game because they have to kind of like solve a yes. puzzle in the game, go on the website, listen to an audio, which helps them with the next clue and, and so on. So it's very interactive, very digital as well as physical. But when you first launched that website, launched the first game, which was that the Confederate Spy Mistress? That was the it first? It was, yes. Okay. And you have the second and third one ready to go for... I had, the, I had the second and third one ready with like just regular envelopes of labels on them sitting in my coffee table. They weren't like ready to officially go out, but all the thought had been done, all okay. the puzzles had been done. How many versions of the first one was printed or made? There were two versions of it that, that officially came, plus about 80 billion versions of each puzzle. Because I designed them puzzle at a time and then kind of 
fit them together like a massive jigsaw. So, but I mean, um, like the, you know, you, you're going to turn on a website where you sell game one. Do you expect there's only one, one version sale? of that? No, no, but I mean, like ten oh. sales, a hundred sales. Like how many? Because you, you're making these games by hand, so you have to kind of like right. How many? I how much inventory do you need? You know, <laughs> I told my mother at that stage because she was very supportive of me, but she also was kind of, you know, hey, you know, this may not work out, you know, manage your expectations. I told her I'd be happy if I made 15 sales that first month. And I blew that away uh, very easily with that. So did you make 15 versions of the game? Like, Well, for the, it, would be, it would be the, I, I made copies, 15 I copies of the game then. Yeah, so I was hoping to. But by the end of the first month, though, I had 70 or 80 that went out. Oh. So I had to make 70 or 80 identical copies of that first game. Wow. <laughs> which, you know, especially because the game itself is a box and inside the box are a series of envelopes. That first game had 13 different envelopes inside of its open, each oh one that had different objects inside of the envelope. Wow. So, I mean, you do the math. When I started in 13 envelopes, tying 70, that's a lot of envelopes to be stuffing and stickering and black light messages to be writing and paper to be cutting and ribbons to be trimming. So it Nine, was a lot of work. 910 envelopes to make. But there we go. One. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it felt, it felt like a million at that stage. And <laughs> so now when I'm stuffing thousands, it, it, it doesn't feel as bad anymore, though. I guess I'm, my fingers are used to it, I guess. Yeah, training. Um, how did you make 70 sales in your first month? Well, I'll tell you, it was a little bit of luck, to be entirely honest with you. I found a subscription box marketplace. They were able to help market my box, and they sold it on their own store. So that was good to get some exposure, especially when I didn't have much marketing budget. I chose to take, from my personal savings, $500 to start the business. And I repaid that $500 to me within month one, which I was really happy about. But I did some Facebook ads, and then even more, I marketed it to my fan base. There are actually Facebook groups and websites devoted to escape room enthusiasts, people mm. who have done hundreds and thousands of escape rooms. One of my subscribers has done over a thousand escape rooms, wow. which, I mean, is incredible. I mean, I believe that they are one of the Guinness Book of World Record holders for a uh, number of escape rooms played in a day for that one. I don't think they did the total, but they was number in the day. I thought you did 100 was already like a record, but 1,000, wow. Yeah, really. do, oh, do, no, there are some people that are like, oh yes, this box reminds me of a, of a game I played in Amsterdam. And I'm thinking, <laughs> well, it wasn't me. I didn't go there. So yeah, I marketed it to them. Did you know about all this community prior to launching the business? Like, were you just part of this world? I knew about it, but I wasn't part of the world as much. I'm glad that I joined the world because now that's my favorite Facebook group to check every day is, you know, seeing what new rooms opened up someplace in America or a new puzzle someone saw. But I didn't know it was quite as big of a fan community. I was kind of shocked about that. So in my own research, I was shocked how many people liked it. And then when I started having reviewers ask me to play the game, that kind of got it out a little bit more because now you have these reviewers that had their built in fan bases as well who are hearing their honest reviews and like youtubers or bloggers or these were more blog bloggers and podcasters uh that did this i have some youtubers that have done reviews however i don't have too many because they want to show the entire game all the way through Mm. and usually i don't like the entire game being exactly (laughs) because i mean i have a few people that want to show puzzle by puzzle and i'm thinking well that's great but no one's gonna buy the game if you show Mm. puzzle by puzzle all the way through but yeah, so they, they gave very honest feedback, and I, of course, listened to the feedback, because when you're going to be dealing with people who are that big of experts about the escape rooms, you have to kind of go with the flow, and you listen to their expert advice, and you make changes to the product. So although there was only one version of Escape the Confederate Spy Mistress, the advantage is that have future games coming, I can make changes for those future games and get them so that you know the materials are higher quality, and so that... As you play the game, there are multiple puzzles that can be worked on at once, not, you know, having to solve puzzle A to get the puzzle B. Mm. It's not linear. You can do multiple paths. Exactly. So things like that that I learned as I went. And so that makes it more successful that way. So I can understand the marketing of month one. You've got this box club membership type site that promotes you. You've got Facebook groups full of escape room fans that you can sort of interact with and mention you've created a game. And you've got podcast people who are and bloggers who will do reviews. So that's how you can reach potential customers. A couple of other questions. I'm sorry if these seem a little bit basic. People love hearing this. How did you decide on a price for your product? 
I went, and this is probably not the correct way to do it. So yeah, I fully take the blame for this. But I went at it a different way than most people would have, which is I looked at the average price for an escape room for one ticket, which is usually $29.99. There are some rooms that charge more and some that charge less. But I thought it'd be a good marketing tool to say, bring the entire game and all four or five of your friends can play for the cost of one ticket to an escape room. Right. And so I originally started it out with that price itself. The cost of goods is, you know, far lower than that, but it does take a lot of cost to, you know, your secure, time. <laughs> secure, time, secure the artwork because, mm. you know, you, you can't just pick random images and copy and paste onto there. You get to buy artwork and buy all sorts of stuff like that. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do this, not to mention the labor it costs. So, right. so I kind of stuck with the twenty nine ninety nine for a box because that's the price of one ticket for an escape room. You can have right. your entire family pay for the price of one. Or maybe the price of like a dinner meal, or even like buying a board game. These are kind of like yeah, well, buying some... Monopoly anymore is to be even more than twenty nine ninety nine because yeah, you know true. probably way more than that now. Okay. Oh yeah. And last sort of basic question in terms of the technical aspect of this, you've got shipping, you've got taking a payment online. Can you just describe how you did that during the start? Luckily, too, as, as a start, that, and I, I can't say the name of them, unfortunately, but that subscription box marketplace that I worked with was very good with helping me get set up. They knew that most people that started up subscription boxes were newbies. And so I immediately learned, you know, what a payment processor was. You know, people can't just mail you a check in the mail and go, ta-da! Mm -hmm. And they can't, you know, obviously email you credit card stuff. So suddenly I have this payment processor in place that can get it set up. I have a community, a Facebook community of other subscription box entrepreneurs who I could kind of follow and they could give advice to. So I was able to scour that, learn what worked, what didn't work, talk to my advisor from that company. And I still have that same advisor today, which is kind of cool because I'm actually now working with them to help out other people mm -hmm. who are starting up subscription boxes. That is cool. So that was a big start for me um, was using that. So they kind of like an all-in-one transaction management tool. Exactly. Right. Yes. But you, you're no longer with them or are you still with them? I am still with them, okay. yes. And what about delivery of the actual product? Well, that is all – the delivery of the actual product started out with everything being shipped out of my local post office. And I lived, I lived at that stage in a very small town in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so I would ship all these boxes out of the United States Postal Service post office, which was great when I had 70 boxes, although I got a lot of groans from them going in there. <laughs> but eventually when I had you know, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 boxes going out, when I was pulling back to the loading dock, you would see everybody at the back dock start to scatter like they would see me coming <laughs> it was like red alert we got the, the boxes coming and i'd stack it up and eventually i started getting all these excuses sorry we can't take any boxes today and things like that so i eventually had to go to a fulfillment center which i'll talk about a little bit later but yeah so i initially did start it up by just mailing everything united states postal service using stamps.com to figure out the prices and getting the labels made and shipping them out. All right. So we can kind of sum up month one. You made the games, you shipped the games, you use this subscription platform to sell the game and make some sales, take the money. You paid back your initial investment of $500 and you probably worked your butt off to make oh, all the games sure. and fulfill everything. So tell us how you go from 70 sales to 1,000 sales and then to a million dollars in sales. What happened over the, the coming months? The biggest thing was honestly to retain the customers that you had. In the subscription box industry, there's something called a churn rate. And a churn rate is the number of subscribers, the percentage of subscribers that leave you every month. And so a lot of times they say that if you are able to have only 10% of your subscribers from a month leave you, you're doing fantastic. Average is about 15 to 20% of your subscribers will leave you. I've averaged at about between 2 and 6% of churn rate. So I don't lose a lot of customers because when people start playing the game and they like escape rooms or they like puzzles and they realize that mine isn't a bunch of cardboard like Sudoku puzzles in there. These are actual like serious escape room puzzles they're playing. They like to stay with me and get longer terms. So you start keeping the customers you currently have and just adding more to it. And, you know, I marketed a bit more on Facebook, although I will be honest with you, Facebook marketing did not do as well as I'd hoped it would. It was very expensive for a startup to be using Facebook marketing. So I sort of went to, I guess you could say guerrilla style marketing of having my subscribers more or less market the game themselves. The word of mouth made this spread a lot faster than anything else. 
where subscribers would tell each other. They'd play the game. They'd post pictures of them after playing the game with their time and share it with them. All of my games can be reset when you finish them so you can pass off the game to a friend. Mm -hmm. And so people would play the game, pass off the game to a friend. The friend will go, that's fantastic. I want to play this myself. And they'll subscribe. So right now, I will be entirely honest with you. I have a marketing budget of zero dollars today. Wow. And I've had a marketing budget of zero dollars for over a year and a half now. I just let it grow organically. I keep the subscribers I have. I do join lots of sales and free promotions around major holidays like Mother's Day, Christmas. But I let the, the business itself keep people and and run itself. Do you maintain like an email database or anything like that? Like I do. Yeah, I, I keep every single email of everybody's ever purchased the box. But then we also have a website newsletter that is growing. I mean, we have thousands of people on the website newsletter list. And so I'll send out monthly puzzles and deals and things like that. But that's entirely a free method of getting people to go yeah. with mm -hmm. the, using that email system, which is wonderful. So I'm guessing a lot of sales come from the subscribers to the the list who haven't bought the product or haven't subscribed yet. What have you done though to encourage this growth? Because I'm assuming a great product, so people will then share it just organically, like you said. Right. Is that it? Is that been enough to get from 70 sales to you know 5,000 sales of a, a product? It is. However, also finding the right social media influencers okay. who will do it for free okay. is a big thing. Now, once you start a business, especially when you're in the public eye as much as mine has been, you start having people daily. And my email manager and inbox done can attest to this, <laughs> that will email you these, hi, I'm so-and-so. I have a YouTube channel with 5 million followers. You actually look at it and they're like three people. Please send me a copy of the box. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that won't do it. But eventually I was able to pick up some big name people who have played the game. For example, a daytime CBS game show has featured my box as prizes oh, wow. on there. And every time that's happened, we've gotten lots of uh, sales afterwards. We recently were How named did that happen? In, did you ask for that or did that just happen organically? A little bit of both. I mm -hmm. asked actually for a different game show and that was on there. I, I had actually tried talking to them. And although that fell through, the other game show was like, hey, I heard you wanted to talk to them. Hey, we can use you. And that was kind of a cool, like, oh, nice. Mm. I, I, I wasn't thinking about that. And so that kind of happened by accident, I guess I could say. We were recently the USA Today 10 best list for the 10. We were on the 10 best subscription boxes for 2019 list. So after getting all of that, I mean, that has been marketed everywhere. And that's been able to help us out with growing. Mm -hmm. So but most of it is seriously just keeping the people I have and letting people share it themselves. Because I'm finding that spending that amount of money in advertising does not bring me back the conversion I thought it would. Yeah, the ROI. One question about this retaining members. So I understand what you're doing with the series, the serialization of the gaming, which keeps people interested in connecting the stories. That to me, though, like clarify, if I join now, do I start at chapter one, right? So you've actually got x number of months of a ready-made games that can go out to me so you don't have to stay ahead of me but you still have to stay ahead of the people who are on subscription month 20 or or 24 or so there are some murder mystery subscription boxes that do that that, mm -hmm. that take everybody back and start at month one yeah. but we actually do things very differently than most other companies do which is the fact that right now we are on box oh goodness 15 that's mm -hmm. about ready to come out very soon you will actually start with box 15. Oh. You'll get a, a little bit of a summary of what the story is, and you just jump right into the story. Because the advantage is with the story is that you really don't need to have played the games before to get the idea of the story. You just need to keep hold of what you have to get you into the future games. The advantage is, is that if you really like the game you played and you want to play the previous ones, you can buy the previous ones on the website as retired games or as standalone games. So although if you start subscribing, you don't get the story right from chapter one, you get from chapter 15. If you want to, you can go back and purchase, you know, games, you know, six or seven or nine or do things like that. Same price? So you go back to an they are actually $10 more for the retired boxes because okay. with the fact of the number of that I had to go out with retired boxes. In fact, we just had a retired box shipment that went out Monday. 
we're looking at thousands of retired boxes going out and each one has to be remade. With the current boxes, we can get a whole bunch made and have some back as leftover inventory in a warehouse. But with some of the earlier games, when I was only designing them with 70 or 80 people in mind, now suddenly having, you know, hundreds of people every month that want them, it's hard to keep up the demand for that. Uh, So it takes a little bit of extra time to recreate some of those games. So we charge $10 more. Right. So the you you learned what the difference is to manufacture for 70 versus 5,000. Exactly. Because certain pieces of the game are hard to mass produce. So you kind of had to learn on the fly with as you develop new games. That's interesting. Exactly. And I also learned because I wanted to originally do the idea where everybody started on box one. Think about it, though. If you had just played because your friend had been having a party and they had box one they were playing and you're like, oh, this sounds cool. I want to play the game. I'm going to subscribe. You don't want the same box you already played with your friends. You want a different box. Mm. And so this way it ensures if you subscribe, you always have a different box from somebody else. Yeah, okay, that's so cool. you can play a game with somebody else and it can just go back and choose a la carte what you want to play. Correct me if I'm wrong, though. That means you have a perpetual stress point in your life where you always have to produce a new game every two months because everyone is starting at that point. That is point. very true. That <laughs> is very true. So I have gray hairs when I'm 30 years old. So yes. <laughs> well, it must be keeping your creative juices flowing. That's for sure. It is. I love it. You can't take me to a department store without me stopping and going, oh my gosh, look at that cabinet over there. That'd be a good puzzle. I'm taking pictures of it and thinking, what can I do? But it does give a certain amount of stress, especially, you know, there are those months where things are crazy. Life is crazy. And then suddenly thinking I have to produce a game and people have very high expectations for it. And if I drop the ball on this one, I'm going to lose a bunch of subscribers to it. And even more, when you have thousands of boxes, some things I still have to manufacture myself at the house. And I have to make sure I have time to actually produce that so it doesn't go out late. Mm. Well, that leads me to my next question. So maybe you could take us forward how you went from this sort of 70 copies of a game production and delivery to what your system looks like today. How do you produce a game? How do you distribute it? You said you have a fulfillment center now. Right. And did you eventually quit your job too? Like, are you still a teacher or or not? Well, I was a teacher for two years. And at the end of last school year, I made the really tough decision to leave teaching. And that was the hardest thing I ever had to do because I loved teaching. I loved my students. But it reached the stage where most nights I was lucky to get an hour or two of sleep. And it was really showing on me. My family were worried about me. My significant other was like, hey, you need to make a choice right now. And so I reached the stage where I kind of bowed out of teaching. And it was really tough, but it was nice because I could actually put my entire self into the business right away. So originally when I started doing it, you know, was sitting on the couch while watching TV and the form of the objects you open up in my game are envelopes. And you have to solve a puzzle. When you get permission on the website, you can open up the envelope and get the next puzzle or the next piece of the puzzle inside the envelope. I still have that system in place. It's just instead of having 13 envelopes like the first box did, each of which will have one or two things inside of it, now I have four or five envelopes that you play with, each which has a little bit more inside of it. And so the game is made in two pieces now. The smaller envelopes that we have inside of the game that you open up, it's kind of like the solution to puzzle seven envelope. I still make it my house. I have a new house. I moved uh, away from the smaller city into a bigger city. And luckily, I was able to get a house that had a large office space inside of it. And so I have a mini assembly line built up in my house. And on a good night when there is no real distraction, I can get through a thousand, two thousand envelopes with stuffing and sealing them myself just by, by listening to a podcast or watching TV while I'm doing it, talking on the phone during that. So that part is done by me. And then luckily, I have a really good deal with a box company that I can do a graphic design on the boxes, the inside and the outside of the physical boxes that are shipped out to people. So I'm actually able to take some of the puzzles that would have been done in envelopes and on pieces of paper instead of the original one, and they're actually printed on the box itself now. So when you open up the box, it looks like a real escape room. You can see a door and you can see a floor and pictures and puzzle pieces all over the box. So that saves time. And then the final piece of putting all the little envelopes into the larger envelopes and into the box and sealed it, I now have going out to a fulfillment center. And that started after Christmas time this past year, because even though I wasn't teaching anymore, after having a very successful Black Friday and Cyber Monday and successful Christmas season, it got to the stage where it was all hands on deck with my friends and family helping to stuff these boxes. And I thought, I can't keep doing, you know, (laughs) 
thousands and thousands of boxes. And my post office was really freaking out at that stage. So I chose to go to a uh, fulfillment center, which was the best decision I've ever made. If you end up having a company that sells things in the amount of volume of thousands a month, it's very hard to do it from your house. And I've talked to other subscription box owners who are in very similar situations. And all of them have turned to this fulfillment center. And it's tough because it eats away a little bit of your profit. The place I go to charges an assembly line startup fee, and then it charges for three cents for every item they put instead of every box. Mm -hmm. So if you start doing the math for that, it it can chew away a little bit of it, but having that time back in my life is so much worth it. I can actually sleep seven hours a night now. It's amazing. That's fantastic. Lights, (laughs) the lights from heaven come on. So going to there, but it's hard to say to give up control of it a little bit. And I have not had any issues yet with my fulfillment center. I love them. And I'm actually giving out more control on having them start some of the smaller envelopes this upcoming month. But it just takes, if you have that personality like I do, which is that you want to have your fingers and everything, eventually you have to give up on some of it. I said earlier, you have to learn everything. That's fine. Still be involved in everything, but you have to learn how to delegate it out sometime mm. or else you're going to run yourself down. I love the iteration process here in your your journey. It's, and it's only a couple of years where you've been this guy who liked history and gaming and escape rooms and a teacher who then uses his classroom to test this idea out and then takes it to his friends and makes his first game and sells it to 70 people. And then it scales up through word of mouth and you start hitting thousands and you're learning to hand over fulfillment. Uh, And it's just like iterating. Okay, how do I make this more efficient? How do I, you know, even move to a better house? I can use some of my profits from my company, you know, and it all helps and all works together. Now I'd be remiss to not ask, when does Inbox Done come into this process? You hand it over email to us. So when, well, when did you make I will, that decision? I'll be very obvious. I'll be very clear with that. I was drowning in emails at Christmas time because when you're selling a product like this and you have, I mean, literally thousands of people a week signing up, like I did at Christmas time, people are bound to have questions and say, oh my gosh, I need to change an address. Or, you know, someone buys it three seconds ago and they're upset it's not on their doorstep, you know, tomorrow. And I'm thinking, Amazon can't even get it to you that fast. So it began to get to the stage where every day I would work for, you know, 10 hours on creating the boxes. I would open up my inbox and inside would be 100, 200, 300 emails sitting in there. And especially people get very impatient around Christmas time, rightfully so, because they were worried about when their box comes. I'll have an email from one person at 9 a.m., then at 3 p.m., and then at 7 p.m. getting more and more angry that I have not answer their email right away. And I was thinking, I need some way to manage this. And so I had some friends that were helping answer emails, but they all have full-time jobs. And I wanted to make sure that they were not employees. So, I mean, they were doing it to help me out. They wanted to help me out because they were good people. I needed to actually have somebody that could devote their time to watching my inbox. And right before Christmas, I logged in and it said 1,032 emails (laughs) in my inbox. And that was not a very pleasant Christmas. I said some not very nice words. I may have thrown my computer across the couch. It wasn't, it wasn't very nice. It was, I felt a little bit like Krampus. And so at that (laughs) stage in early January, I was like, I need to have somebody else take over the emails. And although we're not getting a thousand emails a day now, thank goodness. I mean, still we're getting 30 or 40 emails a day, which it's amazing how much time answering emails takes up out of your life. Mm-hmm. Just this, some for me myself, it is honestly the psyching up process before answering emails that's harder than anything else because I know that I'm at to, you know, deal with, you know, resending five boxes to this person or dealing with a, the post office that literally drops a box into a fountain, which was a real problem that happened <laughs> where they literally threw a box into somebody's fountain. Mm-hmm. So, and then of course the subscriber is upset that why did I throw the box in their fountain? You know, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. So by the time I psych myself up and then spending, you know, a minute or two per email, I mean, you're talking about another two hours of your night devoted to emails. So I found Inbox Done and I talked to you and then I talked to Claire and eventually I found my Inbox Done manager. And it was amazing because they were able to organize the entire system of emails I had because I wasn't doing any organization. I said the inbox and I just answered the emails as they came in. Suddenly I came in my inbox a couple of days after I got done with the training with my manager and they were like, 
15 different folders to the side and everything was color coded and everything was all in its right nice place and there were notes uh, along the side of the screen for me and there were automatic responses and my mind was just blown with this and it's interesting because my inbox done manager or account manager she did not know anything about escape rooms going into it or this business she had, didn't know much about subscription boxes but as we went she learned it along with me. She now knows as much about subscription boxes as anyone else. I actually sent her a copy of my game. She's played it. She knows how to do stuff. And so now she is daily answering the emails for me. The ones that she doesn't know how to answer are the ones she thinks I should see. She puts in a special place. She'll contact me once or twice a day and give me updates of what's going on. It's pretty amazing. And it gives me back that hour or two hours a day which that email time that I would have been spending to answer the emails, I can actually use that as like personal time. Like when everyone thinks I'm working, but I'm actually like watching Big Bang Theory on TV or I'm <laughs> eating popcorn. Like it's amazing. Everyone's like, oh yeah, Chris is at work. No, this is actually Chris's private time, not at work. Mm. So it's amazing getting that back in. Mm. And the more my manager's gotten to know my inbox, the more she's able to suggest things for me to do and suggest the next step and try to get customers back that, you know, it asked a question, but never made a purchase, you know, trying to get them back. So yeah, I've loved it, but it's, it's a necessity. When you get to the business of this size, you can't manage the emails all yourself. There's no way. I totally agree, Chris. I love to hear that story. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're working together and I'm glad it's made such a positive impact on your time. It sounds like you really, really needed some time. You still oh, sound I, like you needed some time with all that. I, I, I still do, but I'll tell you, Christmas, that was, that was not a pleasant Christmas. Right. I will say that. How Probably many Christmas, but not a pleasant. Yeah. How many units did you ship in Christmas, do you think? Oh, I have the number somewhere, but it was probably about eight or 9,000. Wow. Just for Christmas, not including the people who had already been, these are just new orders. Wow. Eight or 9,000 new orders at that stage, wow. not counting the renewing ones. And that's just coming so, from word of mouth and, and organic. Yeah, that word of mouth. And that I was also included with a lot of BuzzFeed lists, which uh, is very nice. Once you grow to a certain amount, people that are making lists of things will find you on their own and free of charge will do advertisement for you. And your story is great. Like it's a unique kind of game, I think. So that's, exactly. that's, that's fantastic. There are murder mystery boxes out there, but nothing like this with an escape room. So in the last sort of five, 10 minutes here, what's the future hold for this? How do you see this rolling out over the next few years? Well, the next thing I really need to work on is the fact that now that I am not teaching anymore and I actually have some free time and now that I'm giving up some more responsibility, I do want to get all of the retired boxes back so they're always constantly in stock and they can ship out, you know, two days after ordering. Right now, if you order a retired box, it ships out the same day or it ships out on a set date, just like a subscription box. Things all ship out in one set date. I'd like to get that out so I can be more of an e-commerce one-time business as well as selling the subscription. I also am well into the ways of trying to get my educational programs going. I have one box that is designed, it's not in the subscription, it's a one-time box that's designed for school kids. And it's actually about the Inca, Maya, and Aztec for teachers who teach 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade to use in their classroom. It is aligned to national uh, learning standards. And so I really want to get that out there. So I've already spoken at several states conferences about how to use escape rooms in the classroom. I hope to kind of bump this back into education and help teachers use this as a teaching aid now, because I kind of want to give back as much as I love doing the entrepreneurial stuff. I loved being a teacher and I'd love to kind of bridge those two together now and be able to sell my products to teachers or help teachers use escape rooms in their classrooms. So I kind of want to go back that way a little bit. I plan to keep going using this uh, fulfillment center too, because I, the more it grows, the more it can handle, the more I can start maybe focusing on marketing my product again on my own now that I have this and get even more subscribers. Mm. I love that you, because you know, it sounds like giving up teaching was in some ways not 100% what you wanted to do because you know, you're know you missing out on the interaction with children and exactly. directly teaching. So that this allows you to step back in that world. And I could see, yeah, this, a whole, almost like a second branch of, of this company, education within the school system where you're providing the materials for teachers to run escape rooms uh, on whatever topic, or not, I mean, puzzle games, whatever yes, you call it, exactly. for teachers. So that's very, very cool. 
Where is this going, you know, long term? Or do you not think about that? Like, do you think maybe you one day you might sell this company or do you think about that sort of thing? Oh, I, I think about that all the time. And I go back and forth on it. I would love to sell the company where the, with the fact that, you know, it would give me back some free time again. There are other projects, other subscription boxes I would love to start. I have a subscription box that I am literally, I have the website created. I'm literally ready to click the go button, but I'm just afraid that I don't have the time to manage it right now. I have other products I want to go to that would be great if I were to sell this business. But at the same stage, I don't, no, if I want to, it's kind of like my baby at this stage. I've created these characters. I've created each of these puzzles. And after a while, I think if I were to sell the company and give up that control, it'd be almost like I'm abandoning these like babies I've created. Yeah, I'd be characters. like, no, what am I going to do? These characters and things like that. You're like George Lucas to... selling Star Wars. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Except, you know, I'd be afraid that Jar Jar Binks would come in for the next, uh, the next crate. It would all be Jar Jar. <laughs> yep. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it would have to be a very good offer for me to sell the business. But I do know if I've learned anything since I started the business, it's the fact that you have to adapt. And if I think that that is the best situation, I'll have to roll with the punches and mm. maybe I can you know, use my creativity for something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Last question, Chris, before we end this interview. For those listening who are totally excited now, totally jazzed about doing their own subscription box of some sorts, what kind of advice would you recommend, especially for them at the very first starting phase? Because obviously that was a while ago for you now. I'm sure you do things a little bit differently. How would you advise someone to start? If you're going to start a subscription box of any type, and I mean, even if you want to start like a candle or a coffee subscription box, the first thing you have to do is you have to plan things out before you even make your first sale. And I wish I had done this a little bit more. Get a year's worth of boxes planned out. Get a, Make a nice spreadsheet of where you want to be in every month. So you don't have to do that last minute rush of, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Also, find those sources to get your product. If you're selling you know, a candle, Make sure you have multiple places that you can get your product from, whether it's an Etsy store or if you're going to go through wholesale through you know, China. Make sure you have several places that you can go through so you're not stuck at that last minute where you're ready to ship out the box and someone messages you, hey, I'm behind. I'm going to be two months behind in getting this to you. And it messes up your entire box. Have everything planned out and ready to go far in advance of selling your first box. It takes a little bit of extra startup. But I swear it'll be a lot easier to you in the long run. And also, once you start getting to that stage where you feel like you are spending more time than is probably physically safe for you to be spending on a business, that's when you should start thinking about giving up the reins, which I wish I had done a little bit earlier. Eventually, I reached the stage where I did it. But I wish maybe I had done that six months earlier. I'd given up the reins a little bit on my business. Do you mean like fulfillment or what what do you mean? Like fulfillment, getting... Fulfillment, marketing, email, things like that. If you find that you're spending so much time on your business that your personal life is suffering because of it, start making some changes to help your personal life out. Make sure you recharge yourself because that you'll be able to do better in the business if you, uh, you know, treat yourself right first. So once you get to that stage, you think you need fulfillment, look into it. Don't do like I did and say, oh, I'll look at it next month and the next month and the next month. Do it right away. You'll thank yourself. Mm, good advice. Chris, where can people find more about you besides, obviously, Escape the Crate? Well, that is pretty much the place I am right now, Escape the Crate. We have a Facebook group. If you have any questions or want to talk to me some more, the email that I have is escapethecrategame at gmail.com. We use Gmail for our actual account because it actually gives fewer bounce backs from mm-hmm. other email sites coming in. Are you on social? Are you personally on? Like, is there, can we follow? Is it worth following? I am I guess. not. I am not. No. <laughs> you have no if time, you, of if course. If you follow my social, it'll be a lot of pictures of my dog. So okay. if you wanted to, you know, follow me, you know, Chris Barnes, which is my dog wearing a sailor hat, my dog <laughs> running into the yard. Sure, go ahead. Okay. But that, that's, unless you're a dog fan, probably not. Okay, awesome. Well, I definitely recommend people check out Escape the Crate. It's not complicated. You know, I think the, the real secret sauce here is, is Chris's creativity in, in creating a great product. So that's, that's your real skill here, Chris. So congratulations. Great job. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Seven-figure business. I Love appreciate it. it. And also, if you happen to use, if you want to try Escape the Crate out, if you use the code PODCAST, uh, it gets you 25% off your first purchase. Awesome. Thank you for that. We'll put that in the show notes so everyone can uh, follow the, we'll get the links and get the code and check out everything. And Chris, any last minute words? Otherwise, we'll say goodbye and thank you. 
Well, no, just good luck, everybody, and try out an escape room in your own town sometime. I mean, it's a lot of fun. It's just better than getting locked in a room with your friends. <laughs> but not your family. You don't want to get locked in a room with your family. No. That's not fun. Yeah, yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, enjoy the escape rooms, everyone, and thank you, Chris. We'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks. Thanks for listening to Yaro's podcast. For more episodes, visit yarrow.blog and subscribe on iTunes or Google.